thanks everybody for uh, joining us, um, both on the live stream and in the room. We've got a great uh, session for you set up, uh, talking to uh, what I would say is arguably one of the fathers of the connectome. I'll be explaining to you, for those of you who don't have an extensive neuroscience background, I'll be walking you through very rapidly uh, at the beginning as to what all that means. And then we'll be talking about um, a classic paper in neuroscience, um, uh, which uh, was the paper where the first connectome was ever defined, the structure of the nervous system of the nematode Canarebiditis elegans, um, published in 1986. And we are honored to have Dr. John White, the first author of that paper, uh, in the Hangout with us uh, right now. Um, so uh, Dr. White, actually, would you like to introduce yourself first? Oh, hello. I'm uh, John White. Um, I, I worked in Cambridge uh, on the Connector pro Project. Uh, I started there in late 1969 and um, worked through it um, pretty well until it was published, which I think we submitted it in, in uh, 1985, if I remember correctly. So that's my involvement. And, yeah. uh, at, at, at the present time, I'm, I'm retired, but I... Uh, Try to keep the uh, little uh, gray cells busy and uh, following various things on the internet. So. Very good. And folks have wondered where you're calling in from. Um, so I'm, I'm calling in from a place called Salcombe uh, in Devon. It's near Plymouth. It's a little um, sort of seaside town, and I can look out my window here, and see the sea. It's raining at the moment. So it's <laughs> Very good. Well, it's a true honor to have you, and uh, we'll be picking your brain here as we go forward. So um, let's go to uh, Steve and Scott. Would you guys introduce yourselves? All right, so I'm Stephen Cook. I was formerly an undergraduate in Dr. John White's lab. I'm currently a graduate student in Dr. Scott Emmons' lab, and I am interested in continuing this worm connectomics field, looking at both historic data from the group that Dr. White was with in Cambridge and also acquiring new EMs to establish new worm connectomes. Awesome. I'm, uh, I'm Scott Emmons. I'm a professor of genetics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I've been working on C. elegans uh, since 1976 and, and uh, have known John White since that time when he was doing a sabbatical at the, in Boulder where I was doing postdoc at that time. And I uh, did a my own sabbatical in, in the John White Cambridge lab uh, in 1986, just at the time that the Connectomics paper came out. So I've been very familiar with this work for my whole career. It's the foundation of so much of what we do. And recently, my lab has had the honor of being able to take some of the original micrographs that were made in Cambridge but not completely analyzed and complete the analysis here in my lab. And uh, we recently published a paper on the male Connectomics elegant. It's a pleasure to have you both, and uh, Dr. Emmons is one of the um, most recent publishers of a paper uh, in C. elegans uh, Connectomics, um, recently on the male tail, um, which uh, was a very nice, uh, very nice paper as well. So it's a pleasure to have you as well, sir, um, uh, joining us. Okay, um, let's go over to Adam Calhoun. Okay, let's see if you can hear me over the garbage trucks outside. Yes. Uh, so I'm Adam. I'm a graduate student at the UC San Diego and the Salk Institute, and I work with Srikanth yeah, Chalasani, who recently came out of Corey Bargman's lab. Uh, and we do learning and behavior, and we rely very heavily on the connectome uh, to guide us in trying to find the circuits that are responsible for specific behaviors. Awesome. Great to have you. Uh, now I'll turn over to Matteo Cantrelli. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Matteo Cantarelli. I work uh, in uh, UCL here in London. I'm an electronic engineer and uh, I'm also part of the Open World Project. Uh, the Open World Project started a couple of years ago. We're trying to aim for a very ambitious goal of having a full scale simulation of the C elegance. We are leveraging all the work that you've done so far <laughs> and trying to take the most out of it. And uh, I'm also working uh, here in the, in the Silver Lab uh, with the open source brain and uh, building 
3D visualization of the network of cells connect on. So that's me. Great. Thanks, Matteo. And Giovanni. Hello, my name is Giovanni Migli. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade. I have an MSc in software engineering and uh, got involved with Open Worm two years ago. I was one of the founding members. Proud of that. And basically, Matteo already said about the project, but uh, basically lend my software engineering uh, expertise to the project and try and basically learn about the science. Which is, what I'm, which is what I'm passionate about. So that's pretty much everything from me. Excellent. And myself, I'm Stephen Larson. Um, I have a background in both computer science and software engineering, as well as a PhD in neuroscience. Um, I've been helping to coordinate the OpenWorm project at openworm.org now for about a year and a half. Um, and um, so I'll be conducting this, um, the first part of this journal club, so the structure of this. For folks just joining, is um, I have I have a slide presentation uh, that I will uh, present on the classic 1986 paper, um, and just to kind of walk you through, um, this is a very large uh, paper, uh, is a, a very meaty uh, amount of information. It's almost encyclopedic in its nature, so I, I unfortunately cannot cover 100% of it. But what I have done is I've tried to at least give you the flavor, the gist of it, um, in the invitation that you've all received. Uh, there's a link to the uh, web page that was created from uh, the website that was created from this paper. Um, so uh, any, everything that I'm showing you is something you can follow along with. Um, so partially um, what I hope to do is to make uh, the paper even more accessible than it would be just looking at it from the beginning so you kind of have a sense of, of where all the things are laid out um, if you haven't ever read it before. Um, and then uh, we'll be turning over to John White to ask questions about pieces and parts as we go, and um, I'm hoping that we'll get some good questions at the end as well from, uh, from the panelists uh, for John uh, for things that uh, you know, aren't obvious uh, from the paper. Okay, so then without further ado, I will uh, share my screen and head over to the slide presentation. Okay, so here we go. So here's the paper, Structure of the Nervous System of the Nematode, Canorabiditis elegans. By J.G. White, E. Southgate, J.N. Thompson, and S. Brenner. I um, hope we hear a little bit more about uh, those characters uh, a little bit later and, and the different roles that they played. Uh, this was published in 1986 in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. Um, it's sort of subtitled The Mind of the Worm, Mind of the Worm. Um, and this is a paper that established um, really the uh, first connectome, although they did not refer to it as the connectome. Um, and although most of us in the room right now are neuroscientists, just in case you don't happen to be all that up on uh, neurobiology, I'm just going to start really quickly with uh, the basic concept that the two nerve, two nerve cells in your brain, neuron A and neuron B, are connected by a physical connection uh, with something that's either known as a synapse, a chemical synapse, or a gap junction, which is also called an electrical synapse. Um, the way in which we see these things uh, most directly are through electron microscopes and electron micrographs. And this paper relies on electron microscopy um, heavily. It is the, the primary technique by which uh, the connectome was revealed. So just really quickly, um, a picture that looks like this under the electron microscope um, is something that uh, folks trained in microscopy um, uh, know what it means uh, to many people just coming from the outside, and certainly I was as, a, as an early uh, graduate student, this kind of looks like a, a bunch of soup. So um, down here is a schematic of a chemical synapse uh, taken from this uh, picture and sort of with the lines drawn a little bit more in detail. So what this is is a slice through a piece of tissue where we're actually looking at a cell, which you could think of you know, approximately as a, as a cylinder, um, or a cell body as a sphere, but, but most often as, as a cylinder, and we've cut a cross-section through that cylinder, and we're looking uh, uh, end-on uh, on that cell, and so the different pieces in that cell you can see down here at the bottom, uh, mitochondrion, these little pieces in here known as vesicles, and we can see a chemical synapse by the features of having um, vesicles on the presynaptic side, or the side that's sending the chemical signal, and a higher density of proteins um, called the postsynaptic density that, that lie on the postsynaptic side. And this is where receptors uh, listen to the chemical signals that are spewed across here, the neurotransmitter, 
spewed across this, uh, this gap. Um, so that's what a chemical synapse looks like, and this is what you're hunting for in an electron microscope uh, when you're trying to figure out uh, those connections between neuron A and neuron B. Uh, in contrast, uh, we'll hear a lot about electrical synapses or gap junctions, um, also under an electron micrograph in the same sort of way, but now zoomed in uh, to a boundary uh, between uh, two membranes. Uh, you might get something like this, where in this case the electrical synapse is made up of a bunch of proteins, and this is uh, now a three-dimensional view, pink on the top, blue on the bottom, kind of a, a cross-section, um, where there's actually channels that physically go across the two cells, and it links the uh, voltage of the two cells together um, when they're opened up so that ions can freely pass between them. So those are the two things that uh, one looks for uh, when one is trying to reconstruct a connectome. And then what you get from that is something which very simply, out of <laughs> this is a, a made-up uh, graph, might look something like this, um, where the gap junctions could be thought of as uh, connections in a graph that uh, have no specific directionality because uh, when they're open, uh, they reciprocally affect uh, the two cells on either side, so A and B might be connected by a uh, gap junction and both be affected, whereas a chemical synapse uh, has a direction, so it has a specific influence of one cell on another. And uh, another thing to note from this diagram is that uh, some cases you see cells that have uh, gap junctions between them as well as, as chemical synapses, although fairly rare, um, and, you see, and you see cells that have multiple chemical synapses on each other as well as multiple gap junctions on each other. So once you go through and, and um, painstakingly look through uh, all these images, which is essentially what this paper did, um, eventually you can come and, and make wiring diagrams like this, and several are included in this uh, paper, and we'll have a look at, uh, look at uh, what a real uh, circuit diagram looks like a little bit later. Okay, so facts about the paper, as I already said. So this is a paper that first showed a connectome. Uh, the paper and the contents took 13 years to develop. 13 years. Um, it is really astonishing the level of dedication um, uh, that went into this. Um, it is a, a paper whose primary section is 63 pages of observations, um, and it is followed by three appendices that total 383 additional pages uh, that describe each neuron in alphabetical order, devoting about two to three pages per neuron in alphabetical order. Um, it uh, also, I hadn't realized this before, but uh, had also consolidated the naming scheme for all 302 neurons that's used in practice today. So names like AVA or um, AVAL as a, as a way of talking about uh, the left version of a cell or the right version of the cell uh, wasn't in common usage prior to this. And uh, there were several different papers that had different naming schemes for neurons and um, this paper um, I think it's fair to say cemented that naming scheme and, and it is the naming scheme that is now used uh, today. Um, and it did that by uh, proposing a classification for um, neurons, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then the paper, basically the, the meat of it is a detailed circuitry and neuron shape for all uh, 302 neurons uh, that are derived from electron microscopy. Um, so a little bit about the organism. Again, um, folks in the room are rather familiar with it. Folks who might be joining might not be. Um, the C. elegans is uh, about a millimeter long. Um, you can't see it with your naked eye, so it's not like an earthworm that you might see squirming around on the sidewalk. Um, it, is, um, it is a powerhouse of biology research. It was the first organism to um, have its uh, genome sequenced. Um, it uh, is transparent, so as you can see here looking at it under the microscope, this is its head. This is its tail. You can actually see right through its skin, um, which makes it very accessible for um, things like doing surgeries with lasers or just looking at uh, its, its internals. Um, in more modern days, uh, fluorescent proteins have been uh, put into, uh, in, into C. elegans to see how different pieces and parts of it work. Um, it has all of 959 cells um, compared to the hundreds of trillions of cells that make up our bodies. 959 is a fairly approachable number. Um, it is also, um, the most common form is a hermaphrodite form that self-reproduces. And that is, um, and for many of these reasons, uh, it was very consciously selected by Sidney Brenner um, as an organism, as a model organism uh, for usage um, in biology research. Now you might say, well, why? So it's great that we still learn things about worms, but, uh, you know, what does that really have to do with, uh, you know, with humankind? Uh, the, 
in, in reality, there's a lot of things shared uh, with all animals uh, and the sea elegans. So it has to find food, it has to find mates, uh, it has muscles, and it has neurons, and it has connections between those neurons and those muscles. Um, it has sensory neurons that um, you know receive information from the world, and motor neurons which uh, output muscles. Um, it has a digestive tract, it has a reproductive system. Um, so there are a lot of things in this organism that are conserved, and a lot of research goes on looking at the molecular mechanisms uh, by which these things occur that are then uh, eventually applied uh, to human beings uh, down the road. So understanding the C. elegans is a very important step in understanding uh, more important, um, uh, understanding how those processes work in, uh, in human beings. And in fact, several Nobel Prizes have been awarded for work done with this little guy, so he, he is truly a, a powerhouse of science. Um, if you want to see more detail of the body of the C. elegans, um, so the project that, uh, that several of us work on, openworm.org, has a browser. You can throw into your web browser right now, browser.openworm.org, and uh, use the slider on the left-hand side. You can look through all of the anatomy of, of all the cells um, in its body. Okay, so back to the, back to the paper. So in the abstract, just a few points that I pulled out um, uh, from the paper. So again, um, the basic structure uh, of the experimental work that was done was to take our friend the C. elegans to uh, prepare him in a, in a solution, to chop him up into slices, and then to throw those slices into an electron microscope, uh, as opposed to a light microscope. An electron microscope uses um, beams of electrons shooting through tissue um, to create images. Um, you have to do that because, um, because um, you have to do that to get resolution that is much better than what you can see in a, in a light microscope. Um, and this is what gives you the level of resolution down to cell membranes to let you actually see synapses and gap junctions. Um, so there are 302 neurons grouping into 118 classes of similar morphologies and connectivities. Um, the, the neurons of the C. elegans have, base, have relatively simple morphologies compared to neurons that we see in other animals with a few or no branches. Um, many of them cluster into bundles of, of parallel processes and have what's known as en passant synapses, which means that the synapses occur um, as uh, two cylinders passing each other directly uh, touching, uh, as opposed to uh, sometimes what we see in mammalian cells where there's a... Um, a axon terminal uh, where a cell branches and puts a connection onto another cell. Uh, the neurons are generally highly locally connected, uh, which means that they uh, make a, uh, a lot of connections with their partners. And uh, this study revealed 5,000 chemical synapses, 2,000 2, neuromuscular junctions, which are connections between neurons and muscles, and uh, 600 gap junctions, approximately. All right, so in the introduction, um, which I, I really urge you all to read for yourself, but just a few points that I pulled out uh, that I found interesting. Um, that, uh, you know, when the paper was written, uh, it, you know, it, it, it talked about how very little was known about detailed neuronal network connectivity. Um, if you've heard of, you know, neural networks in, in artificial intelligence, uh, what's interesting is that in reality, uh, very few actual neural networks uh, of biological organisms have actually been mapped at the level of detail that we're talking about here. So, um, so it was the case then. It is, is still largely true that it is hard to get um, detailed neuronal networks. Um, there are efforts that are now working on that uh, under the realm of connectomics, but, um, but that was one of the motivators. Another motivator was the fact that C. elegans was genetically mapped, and the idea that um, understanding the entire developmental life cycle of the C. elegans um, the fact that we know how every cell division comes about and we understand how every cell uh, is derived from every cell division was a motivation for this. Um, so this concludes connectivity of all the neurons in detail, minus those in the pharynx, which was included by another, uh, uh, another paper. The pharynx is um, up at the front of the worm. And uh, it does uh, point out that um, this is structural connectivity, but there are other kinds of connectivity that are important for the full functioning of a nervous system, uh, not to mention the diffusion of elements of proteins within the body of the worm um, and potential coupling uh, electrically uh, that is not driven by uh, synapses or gap junctions, uh, but that it's important uh, that you get uh, pretty far with uh, having the structural connectivity. And, and it also points out that this is a, uh, and something that I think not everybody realizes, is that this is a canonical nervous system, which is in fact a mosaic 
that was put together by uh, of several nervous systems uh, of C. elegans all, but um, of different individuals. Um, and part of that was done in order to uh, have uh, some reliability to make sure that um, this wasn't um, just what you saw in a single worm. But um, this is the key diagram for that mosaic reconstruction. So I think this is an important picture to understanding the work. So um, so because of the realities of what it takes to do these kinds of reconstructions, um, you it, it makes the most sense uh, to take bits and pieces, or it made the most sense to take bits and pieces um, and put them together. So these different uh, abbreviations here, so this is the pharynx that we referred to earlier, which is this very notable structure up at the head of the worm, and this is the tail. Um, so these different um, pieces were taken, so you imagine that you, you take the worm and you start making slices like this, and you add up the slices, and then you call that set of slices, um, in this case, N2T, another data set, uh, N2U. Um, and um, and uh, JSE, all taken from adult hermaphrodites. Uh, two other sets that uh, the paper notes, N2Y, this section was taken from a male. Um, and then this section up here, JSH, was taken from an L4 larva, which is the, the life cycle stage just prior to adult. Um, so, this, um, so it's a composite, essentially, of all these pieces that went into creating uh, the connectome. Okay, so how, do, how is it done in a little bit more detail? So first you take your C. elegans, you grow them up on dishes, and you give them tasty bacteria known as E. coli to eat. Um, you then uh, take your worms, you uh, put them into a gel, uh, a, a gel solution that uh, stains them, and you eventually put them into a block that allows you to cut them. Uh, you use a diamond knife to cut sections of 50 nanometers, um, which is uh, very small. I actually, um, in, I, I always like to show for comparison um, the scale of that sort of thing. So let me just really quick throw this in over here. So I always love this uh, scale of the universe uh, application, which gives you perspective on, uh, on 50 nanometers. So this is what a micrometer is where you've got the largest virus and a bacteriophage here, um, smallest thing visible to an optical microscope. And as we go smaller and smaller, you, know, you get HIV, um, you get a, a virus, and you get a gate of a transistor inside your computer. Um, you get down here to a cell membrane, a uh, phospholipid bilayer, a little strand of DNA, <laughs> and um, an in individual molecules. And then finally down here at the level of individual molecules, you get down to what just one nanometer looks like. So 50 nanometers is you know, probably somewhere around here. So you have to use a diamond knife to slice tissue that small. Um, and, um, and so you get sections um, 50 nanometers um, uh, thick. And then you take those sections, you prepare them, you put them in an electron microscope, uh, you shoot electrons through them, and then prints were made. Eight, some 8,000 prints were created. Um, for the entire connectome. And there was some computer-aided reconstruction used, um, but most of the reconstruction was done by hand. And this is uh, the first jumping off point, I think, uh, just to ask uh, John White here. So I'll cut away for a second and go back to the Hangout. So um, Dr. White, when we were speaking earlier, um, here, let me uh, get back to the Hangout, sorry, oops. We were speaking earlier. Uh, you told me that one of the ways that you got into the Brenner Lab uh, in the first place was you, your experience with computers at the time. And this is in the early 70s. Um, so I wonder if you can say a little bit about um, that computer background, and, which is of interest to those of us who are computer engineers and doing simulation now, as well as uh, what kind of computer-based reconstruction was used on top of the manual work that was obviously uh, done here. Okay, sure. So um, in the 60s, uh, from about 1964 uh, until 1969, I worked in another medical research council laboratory, and, and there um, we got a, a, a very early uh, version of a, an integrated circuit computer, a little Honeywell DDP 516. Um, 
which we really uh, experimented with to see what one, uh, we could do with it. And the thing that I worked on there was a, a way of uh, driving a graphical display, which was just an oscilloscope at that time with a long persistence cathode ray tube, and um, displaying molecular models. And um, so uh, that was an early attempt to, to show what a molecular model looked like and to be able to animate it, rotate it around, and this sort of thing. So. Um, that was what I did there, and uh, at the time I was also doing my undergraduate degree. I got a scholarship from the Medical Research Council, and uh, when I finished my degree, I, I more or less sort of moving on working in industry, computers, but um, I won't go into the, the, the detailed story, but uh, um, uh, someone directed me towards Brenner's lab, um, saying that, that he was wanting to set up a computer-based project to start in the the nervous system of this small worm. So I, I went up there and um, spoke to him and then eventually joined the lab. And what uh, we decided to do was to use a computer to uh, trace the outlines uh, from uh, the electron micrographs of serial sections and then build up in the computer um, a three-dimensional reconstruction of, of the, um, the structures that we were traced in um, particularly the, the, the nervous system or the neuropil, and also that we would enter in um, other information, key information like the identity of synapses and where those synapses occurred and, and all this sort of thing. So we built up a database showing both the three-dimensional structure and the connectivity of the nervous system. And this involved the, uh, the development of a certain amount of technology, we, you know, from things that um, were used to align um, serial sections or uh, micro micrographs. We had a fancy machine for doing that and transcribing them onto 35 millimeter film. And then these were back projected onto a, a screen, a, a digitization tablet. You couldn't buy those things in those days, so we had to make our own. And um, we, we traced all these things in. And uh, uh, basically, it was done on a computer that had about uh, oh, 64 kilobytes of store. It was a 16 bit computer. It's an English one, um, and it had practically no software with it as well. You know, so we um, you know, didn't have the things you take for granted. It didn't have a disk operating system, and it, it just had a very basic interrupt handler. Um, so you know, the first thing we had to do was write a disk operating system, and we had to write a, a text editor uh, and all this sort of thing. And this is. Um, the fact that Sidney Brenner got really involved with this as well, and, and, and he um, uh, got extremely interested in, uh, uh, did quite a lot of programming in assembly language, which is, um, is really quite, quite remarkable. And so between us, we, we eventually uh, developed this system, and it, it did all work. Um, and the, the thing about it in the end, though, is, is, is that I, I think it was really, as far as an amateur, uh, Goes a, a proof of concept because it, it worked, but um, it worked on regions of the ventral cord uh, quite nicely, where you have this nice parallel bundle of fibers and you can trace them all in, and it was lovely. But because you spent all this time tracing them in and putting all the data in, and really what you got out of it was a parallel bundle of fibers which you knew was there anyway. <laughs> so it, it, it didn't sort of add um, much more to what we could do quite simply by, by hand. Um, it was useful for visualizing the structure of um, uh, sensory receptors, and um, indeed some of those structures are published in, in the, the, the paper of, of Sam Ward and, and, um, and the, the rest of us. Um, so it was useful from that point of view, and it was a useful tool for three-dimensional visualization. And the, the other a rather key thing that it was useful for, was, it sounds very mundane, but it was actually rather important, was uh, just a, as a, a check for all the synapses, because we, um, in order to get some sort of reliability, we um, uh, recorded all the synapses at least twice. And so um, be, this was done because we followed an individual neuron, one process at a time, and recorded all the synapses that uh, it gave and also the synapses it received. And we would do that for all neurons. And so even if they had just one synapse, you know, that everything would be there at least twice. And where you have uh, dyadic or triadic synapses, you'd have even more, obviously. So we did all this. And then 
of course, you have quite a long list of things as well. So, and so we use the computer to go through this, these lists for consistency and, and, and check out to see when um, something was only mentioned once or whether it was inconsistent data. And this was actually quite useful to go back and then edit it as we go straight back to the um, um, straight back to the the EMs that uh, that particular synapse which was only recorded once to see whether it was real or or, or what have you. So, so that was the the, the use of the computer. The, the, what it would have been nice to use for was to um, to reconstruct the um, you know the central region of nerve uh, of neuropil, the brain of the brain, if you like, the, the nerve ring, and really to get sufficient resolution to sort of see all the synapses and gap junctions and what have you. We had to take several um, you know, pictures of each section and stick these all together, and make a montage. And so for the, the main reconstruction that we did, we have a six-way montage, and so we had six prints together. And, and um, you know, this was actually quite a high-resolution image. Um, so probably, you know, we, I don't know if we really measured it, but we would probably had an image of about 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, um, um, although, of course, it was analog at the, at the time. So. Um, you know, this was way beyond the um, the capacity of the of the computer system that we had. We just didn't have enough um, uh, megabytes, gigabytes. We didn't have enough uh, megahertz or gigahertz in, in terms of processor speed to, to really contemplate doing anything like that. So, um, no, I I, that's the the basic <laughs> story of the computer. My computer. I, I love it. So it's it's awesome that the first Connectome is also so tightly wrapped up with some of the earliest computers. Um, and also, I, I love that, uh, you know, you, you get this proposal where, uh, you know, we're going to, um, you know, map out, uh, you know, all the synapses of, of an organism, and we don't even have a computer that has an operating system or a text editor, so we're going to write that ourselves first. And then we will go on to doing that uh, very ambitious work. It's, uh, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's an awesome story. I love that. Um, Okay, let me let me uh, keep going here. Um, I want to show off some. I want to get into showing off some more of the paper, actually, and some of the lovely diagrams that go with. Um, so let me just uh, switch back to that, and um, we do have some questions coming in, by the way, um, on um, on the stream for the event. Um, I will I will take those at the end, um, but please add those comments and questions as you have them now, um, and we will we will answer them as we go. So, um, so a lot of the construction was done by hand from about 8,000 prints. Um, let's go on. Okay, so what does this look like? So here's, uh, here's an example, actually, from, uh, this, uh, from this data set. This is one, one of the pictures from the electromicrographs. As I've shown you before, it kind of looks like soup. But you can at least see, I'm sure, um, those of you watching, from the out external outline of the, um, of the worm that uh, this is just cutting right straight through it. Um, and so what, what uh, the work is is then to zoom in on a section, like let's say that section, and now we have a higher magnification look at this. And um, you can see a few features of this and that um, start to show up. So um, here's a cell and here's another cell. You can actually see, if you look very carefully, that this one has been numbered 70. So by hand, uh, the, there was annotation of the individual, uh, of the individual cells. And then you go and you look for the features that I talked about at the beginning, um, which is you look for chemical synapses, or you know what what appear to be chem chemical synapses and, uh, and electrical synapses, and then you mark that and you say this is a connection. Um, this also requires you obviously to identify the identities of each of these neurons. So maps had to be made uh, where all the outlines of all the neurons were made. This is from a different section um, at a different part of the worm, but again cutting through it. So um, something like this, you had to uh, be able to identify each of the names. And so a naming scheme was important. Uh, as we said before, this codified the nomenclature. So, um, so you had to do both. You both had to identify the cell, and you ha then had to also go into the I EM and identify where there was an actual synapse and where there wasn't. Um, so the content of the paper then uh, in, in the body of the paper, talks about uh, the nervous system in general, and, and it, it goes in, it, it, it pulls out several of the patterns that they uh, observed, looking through uh, the reconstructions that they did, the general organization of the nervous system and the musculature, uh, lots of comments about the neurons, the circuitry, the functional classifications of the neuron classes, 
um, and the connectivity. Again, I, I don't have time to go through, to review all of that, unfortunately, but I do urge you to read uh, those pieces. But I did pull out some pieces from this uh, that I think are, are worth noting. So the neuron classes, um, so at one point in the paper, it, it discusses the fact that um, there are 118 classes that were pulled out, distinguished on connectivity shape and, and largely what's known in terms of its role, whether it's sensory or inner neuron or motor neuron. Um, there were, uh, each class has between 1 and 13 uh, neurons inside it, and um, so in a class where there is some symmetry, for example, a class could have two members and there would be a left and a right, or some classes had four, would, there would be a uh, dorsal right, dorsal left, ventral uh, right, ventral left. Um, dorsal and ventral are ways you refer to uh, the top and the bottom, essentially, of the organism, but from the organism's perspective. So uh, dorsal, think like a dorsal fin, it'd be on your back, and ventral is sort of your, your stomach, that kind of way of, of dividing up uh, an, an animal. Um, and one of the points that made that was interesting, uh, a lot of work was being done, and continues to be done on the mammalian cerebellum, uh, trying to figure out its circuitry. And in contrast, um, a paper in 1967, it talked about how the mammalian cerebellum has 100 billion cells, uh, but only five cell classes. So 118 classes for 302 neurons, five cell classes for 100 billion cells. Um, actually remains to be seen if only five cell classes in the, uh, in the cerebellum is really the final number when we really start parsing it apart. But largely speaking, I think uh, it is still fairly well accepted. There's actually, I think, been a few more added even just to this type uh, with the uh, Lugaro cell. But, um, but anyway, it's an interesting point that you could really do a lot of distinction of these neurons down here at the EM level um, and that those uh, classes would hold up. Okay, so circuitry, so an actual neuro, a neuronal network, um, a real neuronal network. Um, this is um, a subset, of course, because um, we're not looking at all 302, but this is a diagram from the paper looking at motor neurons in, in the nerve ring. Um, just, just beautiful detailed diagrams uh, that um, once, you've extracted, um, once you've extracted from the EM those different pieces and parts that you can start to draw. Um, who drew these, by the way, Dr. White? Who actually drew these this, these circuit diagrams? Well, I, I laid them out roughly, and um, and Eileen, who who, who did uh, a lot of the um, uh, the tracing of following your neurons, um, uh, drew drew them out. Uh, yeah. Finally, but, uh, they're really they're really lovely, and in the in the PDF, you really can can get down and see the detail and the care that was done here. I was re recently reading um, this book by uh, Edward Tufte on quantitative uh, visualization of information, and uh, it talks a lot about uh, maps and uh, the use of text and labels. And um, I, I think that you know these are really nice examples of um, you know diagrams that start to give you a sense of the complexity, obviously, that's in these um, in these nervous systems. Um, here's um, here's some more. Let's see if we go forward. Um, Here's the motor neurons of the ventral cord, um, as well, showing connections, uh, zooming in again. So partners uh, to this uh, AVA cell. So these letters, by the way, for those of you unfamiliar, the, this is the, the nomenclature, the naming scheme. So every uh, group of, of three letters that you see here specifies uh, a neuron class. Um, and so these are, are coming in and projecting into the neuron um, that you see in the center here. And so there are several of these circuit diagrams that are actually extracted um, out of this work um, as a way of giving you an overall overview of uh, the, the nervous system. So um, the, the, the paper spends the majority of its time, the, major, the bulk of its pages, um, as a guide through um, all, all the neurons um, of, that, were, that were reconstructed. And um, I don't have time to walk you through all 302 of them, but I do have time to walk you through one of them. And, uh, and hopefully I can give you a bit of a guide as to how to, how to read them, uh, because I think it's, um, it's something that every uh, you know, first student looking at this paper has to learn and understand when they're looking at these diagrams, kind of what they're, what they're talking about. And uh, the first thing you have to understand is this, this template image um, of, of a neuron and, and kind of understanding what it means. So... This uh, circle represents the um, sort of a cross section of, of the worm looking at it end on, but the bottom here is sort of a, um, a view uh, that is like a cutaway uh, that includes the rest of uh, the nervous system. So this is, um, this is sort of a cross section taken from a specific part of the head, 
And then as the um, neurons innervate down the, um, the length of the worm, um, you have uh, additional pieces that, are, that come in here. Let me show you that in a little bit more detail what I mean. So the first thing, the first major feature to focus on is this nerve ring. Okay, so the nerve ring is something that you can see in, 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 our, in the worm browser that we put forward. Here it's this thing in blue, okay, and, and this hopefully is not a, a completely unfamiliar. This is sort of a looking at maybe the throat of the worm from the bottom. This is the nervous system here as it, as it descends back in, into perspective. Uh, back into the paper. So this is the nerve ring that is referred to here as the sort of central landmark. It's up in the head. It circles this other very characteristic feature that's in the head that's known as the pharynx, which is uh, made invisible here, but is, is a group of muscles. It's basically what the, what the worm uses to chew and grind up uh, bacteria. So this nerve ring is the thing here. And many of the neurons you can see that are clustered at the front of the worm uh, cluster around this nerve ring. And so um, it uh, turns out to be a very useful landmark uh, for uh, where neurons go. Um, as I get, actually, this is a, another question for, for you, Dr. White. Um, uh, this way of laying out neurons, did you guys come up with this yourselves? Um, was there a precedent for describing neurons in this kind of a template framework? Um. Yeah, we did more or less come up with it. It, it, it it's sort of um, it's a development of other things which you use in traditional anatomy. For example, you know, if you look at the, the bottom half of that diagram on the right, it's like a dissection. This would be a sort of classical dissection. If you imagine sort of cutting down the dorsal cord and then laying the whole thing out, it was uh, like that. But then, of course, we we had the problem that the um, the nerve ring would be orthogonal to that, and so we just imagined that we could sort of. Uh, take a cross-section from the nerve ring and then flatten this out and join it up with the dissective body. So it's a sort of a little bit of a hybrid like that. But it was we were really trying to find some sort of simple format which would uh, convey the um, essence of the structure of the individual neurons. And so that each neuron could be plugged into this format so that the people could see um, fairly easily what the, uh, the shape of the neuron is. And of course, it did turn out to be quite useful for, you know, when people started using uh, GFP labeling, because it, you could relate the sort of structures you see on the GFP label uh, whole mount animal to these. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so this, I think, is actually another contribution of this paper, is a uniform way of laying these neurons out. So we haven't looked at an individual neuron yet. Again, this is just a template, but just again so you can see, so there's the nerve ring, and then the cord that goes down here at the bottom, you can see down here. And so all neurons then are mapped out relative to this general layout. Um, and this is one last view of that nerve ring from the side now, if you're looking at the side of the head. Um, it, it Again, it sort of wraps around um, like this. You can see this in three dimensions on the browser. Um, and then it, it, it goes down this way. So this structure here, um, if you imagine sort of rotating it, just as he said, like a, like a dissection, you sort of flatten this piece out, and so this goes together with this. So you have to have that picture in mind uh, before you read all, you know, all the rest of the 383 pages in order for uh, them to make sense. Um, so um, I picked AVA as uh, the neuron to, to look at. Um, it's um, probably one of the most highly connected neurons in the whole uh, C. elegans nervous system, as far as I can tell. And again, just to confront these diagrams, so again, we're looking sideways onto the side of the worm at the head. This is the front. This is the pharynx structure that I talked about earlier, very characteristic. And the nerve ring goes around it um, at, at this angle uh, that you can see here. And so every cell like this is laid out. So the big circle here is the cell body where the nucleus is and the DNA and all that good stuff. And then the, the single process goes out this way. Um, as the paper noted, uh, many of the cells only have one process like this, as opposed to the kind of tree structures you might be familiar with looking at in, in other pictures of, of classical mammalian neurons. Um, and then this is now zoomed out even farther, so you can see the whole body of the worm. Uh, not all neurons um, need this, because not all neurons go from the head to the tail, but uh, ABA does. And so, um, so this is a way of describing um, what it looks like sideways. But here we have that flat plane layout. And this is, these are the diagrams where you really get the meat of where all the synapses are located. And um, it's why you need to understand that earlier template. So um, I'm going to actually zoom into a few parts here uh, just to show you. So first I'm going to, I'm going to zoom into this section here where we're looking around the cell body. Um, and I'm going to go over here uh, around the other side of the, the nerve ring. And then 
of course, the rest of this sort of collapses all the, the rest of the length of the of the um, of of the body into a, a small section. But then we'll also just go down here. So I'm looking specifically at AVAR, which is the one on the right. So um, here again, just a very nice summary of uh, all the synapses. So again, we get all the different individuals using the naming scheme, um, where those synapses were located exactly, um, and arrow diagrams that point into um, you know, uh, exactly where they were found. In this case, it looks like there's a process actually goes behind the cell body, um, the circle here referring to the nucleus. Uh, going over to this side, uh, here we see some uh, with a flat label, which I believe is the gap junction label. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and um, again, additional neurons coming throughout the nervous system uh, that uh, are synapsed in here. So um, you can see as well the sort of en passant nature that was described uh, in the paper. That a lot of these connections are really being made with other neurons that you know you, that would, if you drew them all, you'd see them just kind of next to each other, all clustered together. But you don't see them. Um, but they're basically being formed uh, by other uh, neurons whose processes or projections are just are just nearby, and the paper reports uh, as one of its conclusions that it forms about half of the it forms connections about half of all of its neighbors that are that are nearby. And then uh, again, further down here, you see again another set of uh, neurons that are connecting again um, with uh, with chemical synapses. And out here, you see one that's going in the opposite direction, showing a, a synapse that goes um, the other way from this neuron to uh, those partners. So this is the meat of the paper, essentially, is these kinds of diagrams of, in addition to the, um, to the, the, the connection graph taken as a whole, but we get uh, these kinds of diagrams for essentially all the neurons. And just in case uh, you doubt that they did <laughs> all the work, uh, they have actually included um, sections from the micrographs uh, that they looked at. They're all printed uh, in this, um, in this uh, massive tome to show you, no, really, we actually reconstructed um, these neurons. So uh, arrows going here to look at AVAR um, at, uh, you know, this slice taken from around the pharynx and other sections here that were marked up. So B, C, D, and E were taken. Um, those are corresponding to B, C, D, and E uh, that were marked here on this, uh, this diagram. Um, so to really show you that, in fact, uh, you know, synapses that they say exist are likely to be there because of the kinds of partners um, of cells that you see that are just around here. So in great detail, um, this, uh, this paper truly provides all of the evidence um, that uh, as, as much as could be printed, really, without, without giving you the raw data sets, um, that, uh, in fact, uh, this is the actual neural network. Uh, this is the actual connectome of, of the worm. So, um, so some conclusions that are made at the end of the paper. Um, again, I'm just taking a subset, but uh, how specifically do neurons make connections? Some of the questions you can ask. Most of the neurons thin up on about half of their uh, nearest neighbors. Um, there is some, also some commentary about the placement of synapses and some interesting things there that I, I didn't note on this, on this slide were that, um, were that uh, if, if two neurons overlapped in a, in a small subsection um, and there was a, a, a synapse between them, that synapse was likely to be found in multiple animals, but if they overlapped across long sections, the exact location of a synapse might vary a bit, um, uh, sort of suggesting that uh, if they only had a small opportunity to form a connection, they would definitely do it. Um, if they had plenty of opportunity, the exact position might, might somewhat vary. An interesting thing you could look at. And then um, it also goes on to speak uh, briefly about a nervous system function, uh, sort, of, sort of saying, well, now that we have the graph, uh, how does it work? and kind of pointing out some of the limitations of experimental work in C. elegans at the time, um, that uh, it's really hard to measure activity from the neurons, so it's hard to tell all the function, but there were some tools that were proposed in the paper. So one is, um, is that there had been uh, ongoing work measuring activity from um, uh, a worm that is larger and can be recorded from and has um, essentially all the same neurons, uh, known as Ascaris. And, uh, and so some work could be done looking at that as, as homologs to C. elegans neurons. Um, so kind of combining the function of Ascaris with uh, the connectivity graph from, from C. elegans. Um, also, killing single neurons with lasers was something that was um, already possible, um, and basically seeing what goes wrong as a way to tell function. And then, and then the third way that was already being employed was looking at mutant worms that were missing neurons um, to see what goes wrong. Um, so that is the summary then. 
uh, of the paper. And um, so now I will, uh, I will um, turn it over to questions. It looks like we're getting quite a few in from the chat stream if you're just joining us. Um, there is a comment stream on the event. Uh, you should feel free to ask questions. Um, but first, I'm going to turn it over to folks here in our esteemed panel. Um, and um, who, ha who would like to go first? Sure, I've got a lot of questions. All right, Adam. Uh, I mean, one thing that I'm really curious about that I realize I don't know is, did you have any idea of the number of neurons before you started this? Uh, you're saying, did we know how many neurons? Yes. Well, you know, we had a, a good idea because it, 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 it's fairly easy to look at these animals under the microscopes and you can see all the cell bodies and, and so you can see all, all the nuclei if you, if you like. So, um, you know, the fact that, that we could uh, do this it, it meant that there could only be a few hundred, you know, <laughs> given that there's probably just about a thousand cells for a whole animal. This is if, if you neglect the, uh, the gonad and the eggs and what have you. So, so yeah, we, uh, we knew this. I think this was uh, Sidney Brenner's, um, you know, the uh, you know, most wonderful contribution was really in choosing this animal uh, to mount this sort of study on, really. Um, uh, prior studies have been made uh, at the beginning of the 20th century on, on Ascaris, the larger one, um, using the light microscope. So there again, it, it got some information there about how many cells uh, were there. But, the, you know, the... I think the fact that this animal has a sort of manageable number of cells and furthermore that, that it fits rather nicely into the window of an electron microscope and so you can um, you could reconstruct it um, in its entirety. I, 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 I think you know, one must just admire the uh, foresight of Sidney Brenner for uh, you know, looking at all these issues and then deciding to amount to what was really a very considerable research effort into this, into this organism. And what, sorry. No, go ahead, Adam. Uh, what, given how technically difficult this was at the time, you know, writing your own operating system effectively and all that, what, what's a, what do you think is the equivalent today? Well, you know, I, I, I think vertebrate nervous systems are pretty challenging, <laughs> really. Um, um, uh, you know, because there are major problems there because of the size of them and, and the fact that um, you know, uh, getting them uh, the detail from the uh, vertebrate nervous systems at the electron microscope level, I, I, I think is, uh, is more challenging. I, I think there's probably more challenging than we had at the time because, I, uh, you know, there are various aspects of that which I can't see how you would do at the time. But I, I think it would be really great if, if some group could go to the next level up. I, 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 I would have thought that just off that central nervous system is doable now, the, the little fruit fly, and uh, I'd really like to see that done. Very good. We've just uh, had somebody new join us. Um, we'll introduce her when she comes back in the frame, but we'll take another question um, from another panelist. Oh, wait, there she is. Okay. Amy, are you there? Amy, you may have to unmute yourself in order to say hi. Um, button in the upper right hand corner. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. Hi. Uh, yeah, Hello. I'm sorry that I was late. Uh, I am. I was en route to Lyon, France, for the World Life Sciences Forum, and my airline uh, went on strike. So I'm stuck. <laughs> so I'm stuck in Munich. Uh, but right now I'm in. I'm in uh, Moritz. Helmstetler's lab actually at uh, Max Planck Institute. So hello from Germany. Very good. Um, <laughs> so you should you should introduce yourself um, and uh, and also tell us a little bit about the lab that you're currently working in, uh, okay. as it has some relation to this. All right, cool. So I I didn't sleep last night because I was on a plane, so I'm a little a little off. But my name is Amy Robinson. Uh, I am from Sebastian Sung's Computational Neuroscience Lab at MIT, and I'm the creative director running iWire, which is uh, the game to map the brain. So we launched back in December, and basically the, the game interface is players mapping the 3D structure of neurons at the synaptic level. And over time, they train this kind of advanced AI to automate this process. Um, we've got, we launched in December, we have 55,000 players. They're kind of averaging about 1,200 hours every day playing the game. 
So um, I that's, that's a very brief introduction to me. I know you guys have been online for a while, so. Um, yeah, no, that's great. So, just so, try to keep it short. No, that's fine. So if, uh, if, if you saw these electron micrographs uh, that I just showed and, and you said to yourself, I would like to do some mapping, uh, you should head over to iWire and yeah. you can. And, yes. uh, and they've actually taken this work that, uh, that Dr. White and his team had to work for 13 years to do, and they've said, let's parallelize it so that we can get lots of people coming in from online to help speed that process up. So with 50,000 players, you'd imagine that you could, uh, if you line them up all appropriately, you could uh, make your way through Connectomes even even faster. Um, exactly. Uh, modern internet technology. So thanks yeah. very much for, for being able to join us. We're currently in this, we've gone through the uh, introduction and, and talking about the paper. And uh, Dr. White here, who has joined us, um, is now uh, taking our questions about how the original um, Connectome uh, was put together, which we earlier learned involved writing his own operating system and text editor with the computers that he was using at the time, so cool. I think is awesomely heroic. Um, so let's go on to uh, other questions from the panel. Just, I, I need to throw something in that um, because my f flight is, uh, my, ch my luggage was checked all the way through to France, so I don't have my charge converters, so I can't stay that long because I don't have that much battery left on my laptop and I don't have a way to charge it. That's okay. So I just wanted to check in because I had RSVP to this, and I just I just now got here. Um, but if <laughs> I would hopefully next time you guys do this, I'll be able to join. I won't be I won't be in the midst of travel. Um, I think this is awesome that you guys are doing this on Google Hangout, and we we can maybe do gamification, citizen science, neuroscience one in the future. So. That's fine, no problem. Understood. We appreciate we appreciate you joining. All right, ciao, guys. <laughs> All right, see ya. All right, so um, just to kind of get things going, so we do have some questions from the floor. Um, so let's see. How did one deal with heavily branched neurons, e.g. PVD, especially in the early days? This seems like somebody who is on the inside uh, of uh, the C. elegans connection world. So, John? Well, you just followed all, all the branches because, um, you know, Basically, you know, what was done is, is that you know uh, um, we would follow one process and then then follow it all, all the way through from a, a um, you know given region which we um, had sectioned, and then when we done all that, that um, you know certainly after we'd gone through all the cell bodies, you know there, there were various other processes left over, so you, you would follow these through and just give them arbitrary labels, and. Um, you know, then you would repeat this again if, if you had more of the same series that was brought with, you could just car carry these on. And then hopefully, eventually, the, these processes would, uh, would, join, would join up. Um, and um, you, know, you, you could get the, the branch structure like that. But, but there was one uh, very remarkable uh, neuron, and maybe the one you mentioned, I can't remember, um, that we missed a whole. A range of the structures. The one that had um, maybe someone who has a bad memory than me can recall this. This is a, a neuron which sends uh, this very elaborate um, array um, of very fine processes all underneath the cuticle that was, I, I think, discovered um, you know, by um, GFP labeling. Do, do you remember which one this this was? PVD. Just the one that Just P PVD. Yeah. And and a LP, which is its homolog in the, in the head. head. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So so you know that was one thing where where we just missed it because uh, uh, those processes I think are extremely small and they you know run between the muscle and the, and the cuticle and and sometimes um, you do get things that look like processes which are in fact um, you know little, little bits of, of of hypodermis which sort of seems to to go out and what looks like. Like a branch, so sometimes um, you know we would see these hanging processes can join up to anything. Sometimes they appear to join to the um, uh, to the hypodermis, but obviously you know in that particular case um, uh, we we missed a whole class. But but uh, in the neuropole itself, you know I, I, I think we pretty well uh, accounted for everything. You know we joined all the little things that we saw up to something. On, on, on the whole, and 
I, I think partly because it was so little branch in any way, you know, even the more complicated ones and the Nürburgring aren't terribly complicated, that, that we were able to do this. By the way, if you uh, if you want to know what neuron, if you don't know anything about what these neurons are, um, you, oh, can, thank check, you. Yes. you can check yes. them out over here at uh, the yes. browser.openworm.org, and you can yes. just type PBD up here in the corner. Yes. And yes. this is this is one of two neurons that just has these crazy branches. It's really un <coughs> uncharacteristic compared to many of the other neurons, um, you know, in in the worm. But uh, there you go. Very good. Um, so let's see. I think we had some other questions. Other questions from the panel? I do have uh, two questions for Dr. White. And one of them is just a curiosity. And is, I mean, on the original Connect homework, did you slice the same worm? Or did you take pieces uh, of different worms and then puzzle them together into the final but, uh, result? There were long um, series. Um, from individual worms. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know, can, can we go back to uh, that slide that you had, uh, Stephen? Yes, it, yes, it, yes. It, I'll bring it up. Um, um, here. Uh, uh, hang on, sorry. So, 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 so basically, um, there are about uh, five. There we go. This, right? Uh, we're not sure in your screen, I think. No? OK, sorry. Yeah. That one? Yeah. Yes, that's the one. Okay, uh, there you go. Yes, and so so you see each of these ones, the N2T, the N2U, and the JSH, were um, series, and, and they were series from, from one animal. And the, um, the one that we got the most information from, I, I think, in terms of the, um, the nerve ring, what have you, was N2U. But, but that was just uh, one series. And, um, you know, there were various technical difficulties there because... Um, the way electron microscopy works is you generally collect your sections on uh, little microscope grids. These, these are uh, cross-hatched grids, and uh, you lose um, quite a few sections because they uh, overlie grid bars. And, and so for the nerve ring, we had to use a special technique which um, uses so-called slot grids, where um, a, a ribbon of, of uh, serial sections which are cut are laid down in this slot in, in, the, in the microscope grid. So we avoided um, you know, losing sections like that. But that is really the, the main problem. It's, it, the smaller regions you have, the more difficult it is to, to, to slot this in, put, put it together. You know, so it, you know, it's really like the DNA sequencing, <laughs> you know, in the early days, putting the genome together. Is that the longer sequencing runs you had, the easier it is to sort of put, uh, 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 fit it together. And, um, you know, so they, really the, the sort of enabling technology, or well, the enabling skill was that of the electron microscopist that we had, um, who was very meticulous and, and could just collect these sections. Because, you know, when you're collecting thousands and thousands of sections, you, you only want one mishap. And, and then, basically, you can't go beyond any gap that this mishap can get. And mishaps can happen in all sorts of ways, you know, like holes appearing in the grids or dropping the grids down the column of the microscope has happened once and things like that. I see there were overlapping sections. Did, did you use these overlapping sections uh, like to like verify that basically when you're uh, switching from one animal to the other and putting them together that they match? I mean, was it challenging to like uh, move yeah, from yeah, one yeah. to the other? Well, there were various things that we could do because um, you know, because as, as we worked on, we, we could begin to identify uh, certain neurons, and you can then pick these up in, in the uh, other animals. And, um, and so we were able to do that. The other thing that helped us considerably, and, and this I, I think is a very interesting thing about the nervous system anyway, is, is that the, um, in the regions of uh, nerve fiber bundles, uh, the uh, individual neurons had a very stereotypic place where they tended to reside. And so you could get a pretty good idea of, of what a particular neuron was just, just by its position. And this position does vary along its length, but after a while you begin to realize that it varies in a very 
uh, predictable way, like you know, in a region where a motor neuron is going to give um, uh, synapses to, to muscles, it moves over to the region where the muscles are, which is fairly straightforward. But you know, once you know all this, um, you, you, you can use this, all these little bits of information together. And so, you know, the, it, obviously, you don't, you don't absolutely know, but, but the, the thing that you do get up, which is uh, get at the end of it, which is, uh, I think, the, the sort of thing that we uh, found most useful is, is the feeling of self consistency. You know, because the the number of neurons in, in, in C. elegans is uh, fed, uh, pretty well invariant, and the structures that we see um, in one particular animal, we could see again in another sort of animal, gave us confidence that 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 um, you know that we could uh, make a canonical structure. The canonical structure made sense, and once with that information, we we can use self consistency. The, the fact that that. Um, you, you know, this region here synapses in a certain way, and uh, this process and the same process in this other sec this other animal synapses in the same sort of way, that they were probably the same thing. And then once you do, do that, various other things fall into place. And um, the other uh, thing that helped us considerably is, is, is symmetry, is that there is a, a certain amount of symmetry, and the symmetry is quite important, particularly in the nerve ring. So we were able to use symmetry to um, see uh, to check that the, the uh, homologues on either side of the axis of symmetry that behave similarly. So, you know, it, it was, um, we were putting together various bits of information, but the, uh, our biggest justification, I think, at the end of the day with what we had, uh, had some basis of reality, was that we could end up with a self-consistent structure. And um, basically this enabled us to go into another animal, which was a, um, you know, for the same genotype and, um, um, you know, identify with, with some, uh, some uh, certainty you know, what particular neurons were that, that could be covered in, in a short region of reconstruction. Thank you. So, to kind of follow up on that, how did you deal with when uh, you had overlapping worms and you were looking at the synaptic connectivity and maybe there is variability between the two worms. Or maybe, you know, you have two neurons that only have one synapse in one. Would they always have a synapse in the other? Um, well, we, you know, we, we couldn't cope with that uh, directly. You know, we, what we put through, you know, were, uh, you know when we draw up the maps, um, the, the, the sort of synapses that you see, you know, some of them were obtained in one animal and some of them were obtained in, in another animal. We um, did... Uh, do some repeat reconstructions um, in the same regions, and, and notably the the N2U series um, was mainly backed up by two other series, the uh, N2T and the JSH. Both of these went through the nerve ring, which is the key region. The, the N2T was a very similar aged animal, but it had large gaps in it, and so that, uh, which we couldn't we, we couldn't cross. But we having done the uh, uh, the N2U animal, we could then identify things in, in the N2T animal uh, just because we recognize what they, they were, even though it's impossible to actually follow them through on the N2T. And then the JSH was a very nice animal, although it was a different development of the and, and, um, and so this, this sort of gave us, um, if, I think, important information about what sort of a synaptic variability that, that we can expect between between animals of the same genotype. I don't think I saw in the paper where did the N two U N two T letters what did what what did those letters signify? Um, where did they come from? Um, this was uh, named given to animals by the uh, electron microscopist um, who basically went through uh, a lot of animals. Um, <coughs> Uh, N2 is, is the, 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 the particular genotype um, of the Cinderella elegans that, that Sidney Brenner decided to um, concentrate on, to focus on uh, for the lab work. So the, the, that's, that was the N2. And then the, the letters afterward were just different individuals that were reconstructed um, for, of that genotype. Um, and um, so they had no particular significance. I, I should say that um, it took a long time to
to get a good, a good series because uh, because the uh, Nicole Thompson, the electron microscopist, was very fussy. Um, you know, he'd spend weeks or months, you know, waiting to try to get a, a good animal that could be sectioned because the the you know the investment in sectioning, you know, four thousand sections and, and then reconstructing was considerable. So it obviously paid to um, you know spend an awful long time on the microscopy. So. The, the you know the microscopy was quite painstaking from that point of view, but but you know I I, I think um, that paid off because you know once you've got a good section you can do a, a good series you can do so much more with it than a, a poor series which covers a rather short a short distance in the animal and that's the key to the, the success really is is getting these very long series of, of um, high quality images. From, from, from the, the animal. Nice. So um, there's oh, some intrigue yeah. related to neurons and um, microtubules uh, uh, in, yes. in, uh, <laughs> on the chat. So yeah. somebody writes in and asks, um, "Do worms have microtubules too?" <laughs> oh yes, 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 very much so. Um, yeah. The, there was a study made of this. In fact, Marty Chalfi, of course, who is uh, renowned now with Nobel Prize uh, really for being one of the co-developers of the GFP technique, um, you know, cut his teeth on the uh, C. elegans, so to speak, uh, looking at uh, the uh, classes of microtubules. That um, people that have been looking at the um, EMs will know that there are certain sensory neurons, like the ALA and the, um, uh, uh, oh, was it the, sorry, the PVA. A L A. Sorry, sorry, my memory is going. No, oh, those are microtubules. Also. Um, yes, yeah, which have rather characteristic microtubules. And then uh, Marty actually made a detailed discovery with these and found out that these microtubules are rather different to the other microtubules that you see uh, in other neurons. Um, and I can't remember those, but I think the uh, microtubules and the AVMs. Um, and the PVMs had uh, 16 protofilaments uh, in the tubulin lattice, whereas the, the other ones had 11 protofilaments. In the, uh, uh, do you remember that, Scott? Can you yeah, something not in, <laughs> I'm having the same problem you are in the detail. <laughs> I don't know the details. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nine plus two, so making 11, and mm. then uh, the other was 15 or so, I think. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, they they very much have uh, microtubules, but um, not as many as you would expect from uh, you know vertebrate studies, and, and also the uh, the type of fixation that we used uh, was not particularly favourable for visualising microtubules in, in it. And it, indeed, it, I, I just mentioned this actually, which, which actually might be of interest and relevance to you, is is, is that. Um, he used um, a technique uh, which is very standard electron microscope technique, just using um, osmium uh, fixation stained with um, uranyl acetate and lead citrate. Um, fairly standard. Now, this gives reasonable sort of preservation of ultrastructure, but it's probably not the best. What is generally thought to be one of the best is, is to, to use glutaraldehyde um, fixation. Um, but when you do this, you stain a whole lot of other sort of cytoskeletal um, components. And particularly in the neuropil, this makes the whole image look rather, rather, rather dark and dense and difficult to interpret. And so I think Nibble Thompson deliberately chose the, if you like, the more, more simpler basic uh, staining technique because it didn't stain as much, but it, 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 it made a, a very good job of staining the... Um, the synapses and the gap junctions and this sort of thing, the things that we wanted to see. Great. More questions from the panel? All right, so I have a question. So I've always been struck by how similar the neural pile looks if you look between individual animals or even looking across different species, such as Pristionchus pacificus, which is a phylogenic mm -hmm. relative of C. elegans and even individual snapshots from different larval stages or between a male or hermaphrodite. But how much uncertainty was there at the beginning of the project that you'd be able to get a full reconstruction of the nerve ring or different structures, knowing that 
with the male tail ended up being a little bit too difficult at the time, but was the was it known that you were going to be able to make it through the nerve ring, or was that just a hope at first? Well, um, no, I don't think so. Certainly when I was taking on the, the uh, lab uh, by, by Sidney Brenner at the time, he, he didn't suggest to me that the whole nervous system was possible, but I, I, I'm fairly sure that, that, that he, he uh, had this thought all the way through because I, I, I tell you this story because it, it, it was rather funny because um, it, you know at the time I uh, arrived um, you know uh, Sidney Brenner was doing quite a lot of anatomical reconstruction that, um, and then by about 1970 quite uh, soon after I arrived a year, year or so he, he sort of moved on to other, other projects you see so and so uh, we were um, uh, working away on it and decided to do it more systematically and uh, sort of worked out the uh, reconstructions of the ventral cord and it was quite exciting then because we, we saw the di different classes and regularities and all this sort of thing. And, um, but, but anyway, um, Sydney came in one day and, and, and uh, was showing a, a, a visitor around, you know, quite often it happens in the laboratory and we're showing this and that and then as he walked out the, the the door. I, I, I just heard him say to, to the guy, um, well, you know, now we're going to move on and do the whole nervous system. <laughs> that was the first time I'd heard it. <laughs> so that wasn't the ambition at the beginning, necessarily. Well, I think it was, but I, I, I think he, he, he didn't want to intimidate the people <laughs> that were working on it. <laughs> so, so, I can make a comment. We have all these series, for, for the others who perhaps you don't know, we have all these series, N2U, N2I, JSH, here at Albert Einstein, and we're doing, we're repeating the reconstructions using our software program, which gives us uh, another reconstruction, gives us a little more information. Steve here has uh, redone JSH, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I invite any of you, if you have these detailed questions about even puzzling exactly how this goes and what they look like, I invite you to come have a look at them and be glad to show you them. Um, and in this connection, uh, I'm just curious, John, is, for example, say on the N2U series, which is such a great one, the actual colored pen numbers on the prints, are they your handwriting or Eileen's? They're Eileen's. Uh-huh. Uh, no, so, so the, the way it used to work is that, that um, she would uh, follow a group of processes through and, and, um, and then, then every morning I'd, I'd suddenly come through and, and, and um, basically talk to her about all the synapses she, she saw and all, all this sort of thing together. But, but yes, yeah, so, so she, she is the real hero, you know, the, the, the one that, that uh, you know, followed each of those processes through. Yeah, and it's quite an unbelievable job to, to think that, that all those synapses, their locations, were being written down by pencil and paper. Oh, yes. yes. They didn't go right into an Excel sheet. <laughs> no. And we have... Uh, we didn't have Excel in those type days, I don't think. <laughs> we have Donna Albertson's uh, notebooks for the N2U series, which is yes. the male series that John mentioned. That we, uh, sorry, N2Y. Yes. Um, and the, the notebooks with the synapse list are just... Uh, you'd be amazed. I invite you all to come have a look at them to see... Uh, uh, what was done. And I have one more question, John. Uh, it's about the subtitle of the paper, The Mind of the Worm. Yes. As, as you know, there's this long-standing dichotomy, about mind-brain dichotomy. In our National Institutes of Health, we even have separate funding streams. We have National Institutes of Mental Health, yeah. and we have Neurological Disorders and Stroke, Brain and Mind. And some people might object that the worm doesn't have a mind, it has a brain, but it doesn't have a mind. So I'm wondering who thought of this? Were you trying to be deliberately provocative? Well, no, it was all terribly silly, really, because um, um, basically we, we wrote this whole thing up, and of course this was uh, in the day before electronic submissions, and so, and so we, we had, uh, I can't remember, but it must have been something like 20 loosely leaf binders. Which was sent to the publishers, you see. Twenty what? Uh, oh, loosely binders. You know. um, that was what was presented to them, and, and then you know we had various other things, um, obviously on the shelf, other binders, and, and so to, to distinguish these particular binders, um, you know, we just said, I said, oh, we'll just call them mind of the worm. You see, so so that was. Um, what they were, that was just on them, just to distinguish them from all the other binders. And so we su submitted these things, and, and that was the, the only time that that was used was on, on the backs of the binders. <laughs> so it was not in the text at all, 
And, um, you know, when it came for the Royal Society to come up with a running title, we didn't give them a running title, so they looked at one and said, the mind of the worm. So, <laughs> it's a silly story, but, but that's, that's how it all, all starts. But, uh, you know, more, more importantly, the, these worms can do an awful lot, and I, I, I think, you know, some of the recent studies of the sort of things that they can do in terms of uh, keeping, um, you know, tracking towards a chemo attractant sort of thing are, are really quite remarkable. And, and uh, I, I used to have a slide, and I wish I had kept it, because it was from years ago, um, where um, Sam Ward uh, had a nice um, picture of um, an attractor to the middle of a plate, and then all these tracks of worms sort of going into them. And then at the same time, um, some um, whiskey company had uh, done this advertisement um, uh, showing an aerial view in, in, in some snow-covered plain in the Midwest or something. There was a little hut there, and there were all these tracks <laughs> you know, going <laughs> into the hut <laughs> you know, because of, of someone was serving whiskey there. But, but the, the, you know, the, the, the point is that, that you know, these little creatures can do a, a, a really quite remarkable range of, of behaviors. Uh, and, um, um, you know, I... I, obviously, the more that's discovered, the you know, the more that uh, I think this this will be be appreciated. And and of course, you know, we're looking at them at, in a very controlled environment. You know, I, I suspect um, you know, in their, in their natural environment, they really are capable of all sorts of behaviours that we that we have no idea about. Yeah, I agree. Uh -huh. So do we have uh, additional questions here from our panel? I have another one. Yep. Uh, so this is not so much about the connectome itself, but uh, I'm interested to see what, what Dr. White uh, thinks about uh, simulation. Uh, so you know that this OpenMode project we're working on, <coughs> we're trying to build, build on top of your work, like fill the gaps of things that are not known. Uh, and and basically, the, the goal of the project is to simulate, obviously, starting <laughs> small steps, starting from the motor system first, connecting the motor neurons to the muscle cells, get this thing to, to crawl. This has been done to, to an extent already by some of the people we are working with uh, in Russia, but we're basically aiming to do that with greater detail. But the, the end goal of the project is to simulate all the cells uh, all the neurons. Uh, so, what do you think about this? Because, like, we hear a lot of uh, skepticism from the field of biology. So some people say, "Well, this is uninteresting because uh, you cannot work on population as you can do from uh, with the human brain." Or, like, you have the problem that you need to be more precise. So, if you don't know exactly what the parameters are for all of these neurons, since they are so few, then it doesn't make sense what you're doing. Obviously, we, we beg to differ, but I'm really interested in your opinion. Oh, I, I think what you're trying to do is a tremendous project. It, it, you know, something that, that I've dreamed about over the years and, and um, would love to have been involved in. Um, because I, I think that you know, with something like a nervous system, you, you've got to sort of ask yourself, what, do you, what constitutes an understanding of how it works? You know, particularly when you have a sort of complex array of... Of, of, of neurons, and you know, you could say that you know, they talk about circuit loops, and uh, something acts as a sort of spatial dis differentiator, or something like, like that. But but you know, you don't really know that. Um, but the thing about simulating something is is it it, it, it puts constraints of, about how it can work, and it, and it shows how it, how it how it could work. It doesn't absolutely show that that's what's happening, but if you can simulate, um, basically you're simulating the whole uh, nervous system here, um, this is the goal as I understand it anyway, to, to you know, uh, presumably from a case where you have a stimulus and, and then your uh, simulated worm will respond to that stimulus in, in a way that you can compare with, with, with a, uh, an animal, a living animal, a wild type animal. So, you know, I think when you can do that, I, I think only then can you sort of really say that you know we 
understand how the nervous system works. And, and this is the basis of the, the understanding will be to show that all the components act in the way uh, that they um, are supposed to. And so, yeah, I, I, I think this is the, when you talk about understanding a nervous system, I, I, I think this is, this is really the, the, the ultimate way of doing it. Although, you know, obviously, philosophically, you know, just showing that you can reproduce everything that a worm does in a computer doesn't mean to say that what goes on in that, that sort of uh, a little one millimeter length of worm is, it, it, is the same. I think it, it, it certainly says that, that your explanations are, su are then sufficient to, to explain the, the, the behavior. And also you can then, having a model, begin to ask really key questions because in the, in the process of making a model, you will find some parameters which are highly sensitive to, to, their, uh, to change and, and some which aren't. And, and so, you know, you will get some ideas of the stability of this. And, uh, and you know, it's an interesting point now, which is a lot of sort of discussions and scientific work about, about, you know, about some biological systems, you know, being basically stable to, um, to, to fluctuations. You know, you should be able to sort of move all parameters by plus or minus, say, say 25% and, and the thing not, not lock up into some violent uh, paroxysm of <laughs> Uh, and, and then comes grinding halt. You know. So, so you need to have, you know, some to demonstrate that, that there is a certain sort of uh, a stability there. And um, you know, I, th I think with the simulated nervous system, you, you can measure this, and, and you, know, you, you can uh, tweak various things to find out how sensitive they are, and then you can. Um, go back and, and then do this, a, a similar experiment in an animal. You know, the, nowadays with optogenetics and things like this, you can actually sort of ask particular questions from individual neurons about what happens when you excite them or inhibit them, and um, and see how this this compares with the model. So yeah, I, I'm I'm a huge fan, and uh, you know, in summary, I, I think that this is the way ultimately we can we should be able to say that we understand this nervous system. It's great answer. Awesome. In fact, uh, like, we're, are we closing? Or can I go ahead. Go ahead. You can. No, when when Doctor what uh, White was was talking, I was thinking about uh, we're working on this uh, perspectives paper, and it's basically called the Turing test for the worm. So, uh, the, when you were talking, I I was thinking of this just because they say like, um, we need we need basically to be able to compare the. We want, we want to put a biologist look at both and, and, and see if, if they can tell the difference. Obviously, starting from very simple scenarios and obviously filtering uh, the video such as so, so that uh, the looks don't make a difference, don't, don't give it away. But um, we're, we're very much thinking about that stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. So we are going to have to close uh, in order to keep the time here. Uh, sort of committed to, to be done uh, yeah. at, uh, at the bottom of the, or the middle of the hour here. Um, but thank you so much uh, to our panel, um, to every, everybody who's joined here, um, uh, and especially to Dr. White, who actually reached out to us at the Open Worm Project. Um, we did not call him. We did not solicit him. Um, we really appreciate the fact that uh, you, you've uh, joined us today. Um, I think a lot of people have uh, been watching. I've seen at least uh, between 12 and 16 viewers on the stream from time to time uh, have been watching. We had folks coming in and asking questions. Um, but uh, thank you so much as well for this, uh, for this tremendous work of science, um, it, uh, without which uh, we couldn't even contemplate uh, you know, some of the work that we're doing. Um, uh, and we, we're real, just really glad to have this opportunity to share it with, uh, with other folks. Well, well, thank you. I, I think you're doing a wonderful job there, and I, I think it's really fun to use these sort of modern uh, communication aids to, to make it into a, a, a sort of international collaborative project. You know, what, what absolute fun, really, really, to be able to do this. And, and uh, uh, I, I really thank you all for sort of you know, getting it going. I was amazed at what you've done so far. I, 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 think, I think it's, it's wonderful to, uh, to, to do that. And um, I, I, I really wish you every success. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to, uh, you know, to join the project in some sort of rather marginal way. 
Absolutely. All right, everybody. So we're going to close out the Hangout here. Um, and uh, stay in touch. Um, we will obviously be in touch with all the panelists, but uh, for those of you watching, um, you can, um, you can uh, follow the channel. Uh, this will be up on YouTube later. Um, you can also uh, feel free to comment us uh, anytime on Google+. Uh, we're on Twitter. We have a mailing list. Uh, you can find all that at openworm.org. Um, so uh, I'll close here and uh, say thanks to everybody. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Bye. Bye.